Well, good morning, Life Spring. It's great to be with you. So I got good news. I got good news, at least for some of you. We all have voices in our head. We do. We all have this, this voice, this constant dialogue. Have you noticed it? This stream of consciousness. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't even stop when you're sleeping. You dream. It's one of the wonders of who you are. God made you wonderful. In fact, scientists are amazed by conscious, this consciousness. Where did it possibly come from? How can they explain it? It is a wonder. And you have this dialogue going on in your head, this conversation with yourself. And part of life, part of the secret of life is figuring out what voice to listen to and what voice not to. In fact, historically, we've had names for it. We, we've talked about angels on our shoulders or demons on our shoulders. Our lesser angels is what the founding fathers talked about. We have this voice in us. In fact, before we're saved, it's pretty much what we have is this voice that carries us from God. It's this voice that tells us, hey, don't go to church. Don't, don't read your Bible. Don't, don't pray. You don't need that. You, you, you just, that's just a waste of time. There's this voice that steers us away. And it's been called stinking thinking is the most modern term for it, but it's called the pagan mind, the lost mind, the lesser angels. It, it's called this old man. Now we're more egalitarian now. It's also the old woman. But there's, there's this thing in us, there's this voice that if it had its way would keep us from God. And then God comes and does this incredible miracle and he breaks through. He starts having this new conversation and he starts revealing stuff to us and he allows us to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And what becomes of you, the, the path that your life takes is really the path of whatever your brain takes, whatever your mind takes. Because as you think, that is how you will live. It will guide your life. And so the Bible's really big about transforming our thinking making it new, making it more in line with God. And that's what we get to talk about today. Because last week we talked about what to put off, which was this old lifestyle, this old, what we called stinking thinking. <laughs> and how today is now, how do we put on this new lifestyle? So if you have your Bibles, we're in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 20. And we're going to talk about how do I play to this good voice, this new voice, because now I have the Holy Spirit in me, and now my thinking can be transformed, and there's actually a debate going on in there, and how can I play to the good voice? Because it's just like that parable. That parable, you've heard it over and over, there are two wolves inside of us, and they're fighting, and the question is, is which one wins? Well, it's the one you feed. It's a great answer. The one you feed is the one that will win. And then the two voices between the Holy Spirit voice and that old man voice, we got to feed the Holy Spirit voice. We got to feed this new thing that God has for us. And today is like cracking the code on how to grow. How do I become who I can be in Christ? How am I transformed? And he starts it off in verse 20. He says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. So he's talking about that stuff last week we put off, that futile thinking. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Now, I'm just going to confess to you, that is incredibly awkward. I don't know who wrote that sentence. I don't know who to blame for that. But most people can read that and like, what? What, what did he just say? It is awkward and confusing, and I totally get it. So, so, so let, me try to, let me try to frame this. He's saying this. When you came to Christ, when you had that powerful interaction with him, and, and you had that step of faith, you stepped over that line of faith, became a true believer because you said, hey, I'm a sinner, and I'm in need of grace, and I'm asking Jesus into my life to save me. In that moment, you were taught something. That's what he's saying. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ. There's this lesson we all learned when we came to faith. And it wasn't Paul teaching it, it was Christ. And we're taught, notice, in him. So when we all came to faith, there was a lesson you were taught. <laughs> and Paul's saying, hearken back to that lesson. Think back to that. Because that lesson holds the key for every lesson. If you really want to grow, if you are serious about becoming who you can be in Christ, if you really want to become the person you can be, your best self, 
He's saying you've got to remember that first lesson you learned at salvation and relive it over and over and over again. Because it is the model, it's the process, it's the pattern now for everything after salvation. So basically, your salvation experience is the map for your sanctification experience. And I know those are big words. But sanctification is just about becoming like Christ. It's growing. So if you really want to grow, if you really want to become who you want to be, that's sanctification. And how do I do that? How do I really grow? Paul says, look at your salvation and you'll know how to do your sanctification. That's, that's, that's what he's saying. There's this truth that was taught at your salvation. So let's think about that for a minute. What happened at your salvation? Do you remember it? Can you think back? For me, that's a long, long time ago. And so sometimes we can forget how lost we were and how in need of a savior we were. But this is how it works for every one of us. There's this moment, thanks to the Holy Spirit, where we get a glimpse of ourselves. I don't think we really see ourselves fully yet, but we see enough of ourselves and we don't like what we see. We're kind of grossed out in the moment, disgusted with ourselves. It's called conviction. So the Holy Spirit comes and he convicts us of sin, righteousness, and the judgment, the Bible tells us. And so he basically gives us this glimpse of ourselves and what we see we don't like. And in that moment of conviction, we're like, ooh, I, I don't like me right now. And, and, and I don't want to be this kind of person. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't want this to be who I am. And we've heard the gospel and we know this story about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins in our place. And we remember that in that moment and we reach out and say, God, save me. I don't, I don't like this. So there's first conviction, there's conviction, and second, there's what we call repentance. That's why we're always saying repent, and it just means change your mind. And in that moment, you change your mind about yourself. I don't like what I see. And you realize you need a savior, and you reach out for Jesus in your mind, in your heart, and you say, come into my life, save me, I need you. It's a, it's a desperation. It is this earnest, like, I need rescue. Deliver me. And we all, that's, you can't be saved any other way. That's, that's the only way to salvation is conviction and then repentance. And then what happens is God then gives us righteousness. So the Bible says we trade, we trade our sin for his righteousness because Jesus was righteous. He, 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 he was tempted in every way, but did not sin. So in that moment of your salvation, when you're saying, save me, Jesus takes your sin away and separates it as far as the east is from the west from you, right? It's gone. And praise God, right? <laughs> That's a wonderful moment. <laughs> and in that moment, your sin is taken away and Jesus puts his righteousness on you. And so God now sees you in Christ. It's said over and over, you are in Christ. And so in a sense, God wears rose-colored glasses. Well, blood-colored glasses, right? And he sees you through the sacrifice of his son, through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he sees you now as his son. And he sees you as perfect and holy and as his beloved. And he sees you and he adopts you into his family and you are saved. That's what happens for all of us. There's no, other, there's no other path of salvation. There's no other name under heaven by which you can be saved other than Jesus Christ. You cannot save yourself. You got it. And so when you received Jesus Christ, you went through a three-step process. This is the lesson you were taught. This is what Paul's getting at. And so it goes like this for every one of us. There's conviction. Man, I don't like me right now. There's repentance. I don't want to live like this anymore. So in turning from yourself, turning to God, and then righteousness comes. You see the pattern? And Paul is saying, this is the lesson you learned in Christ. And if you'll get this lesson, you will know how to grow now. Because it's the same lesson. It's the same pattern over and over. If you really want to become like Christ... Do this process over and over and over again, and you will grow. And so that's what the rest of the passage is. So let's jump in again. Verse 22, you were taught. This is still that lesson in Christ. 
And not by Paul. He's saying, this is this message you heard in Christ. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. That's that old man, that old self. This is the BC days, right? The stinking thinking, whatever words you want to use. That's that old life, who you were before. You were taught with regard to that old way of life to put off your old self. And Paul uses incredible language that we, get, we, we miss in English. So this put off word is about clothing. It's actually get rid of the outfit you're wearing, disrobe. He's saying, you, you, you've got to get rid of this outfit you're wearing. So think like maybe Isaiah, filthy rags. Our, our, our most righteous works are like filthy rags. It's the best we have to wear. And they're filthy, horrible rags. He's saying, put off those filthy rags. Put off that old life, that old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So think about it this way. Why... why why is he saying your old life is like clothing? It's, it's because that's what people see. The reason you and I wear clothes is we don't want people to see. <laughs> right? right? We, won't, we don't want to do that to other people. You say, oh, no, I better put something on. And, and, and so in kindness and consideration, we put something on, right? And, and it's what people see. It's what they're able to see of our life. And that's what he's getting at. So what happens is this, in our minds we think, and because we think we act, and because we act we develop habits, and because we develop habits we create a lifestyle, and out of that lifestyle we create a legacy. And it's what people see. They can't see our inside, they can't see our stinking thinking, they can't see our process, our worldview, our belief system, whatever you want to call it. But we behave based on how we think, our worldview, our perspective. But people can't see that. What they see is our actions. All they can see is see us being rude. And that's what we're wearing. We're being rude or we're being unkind or we're, we're being mean or, 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 or we're being snarky or, or whatever. We're being impatient. We're being a jerk, whatever. But we have this outfit of the old self we wear. It may be a fear. It may be insecurity. It, it may be control. We're all about control or significance or whatever. But the world can see what we're wearing because they can see how we're behaving. And Paul's saying, you've got to take that behavior and strip it off. Put off that old self. And notice, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That's that old way of thinking. That's the stinking thinking. That's that, our lesser angels, that pagan mind, that lost the futility. You've you, you got you you to get rid of that thinking that goes with it because your behavior is being corrupted by how you think. This is why worldview is so important, why we're realizing this is where we've lost the battle in our culture. We've, we've allowed kids and, and ourselves to be trained by this culture and we get this perspective and it, our perspective leads to decisions and our decisions lead to habits and our habits lead to a lifestyle and that lifestyle leads to a legacy. And, and if we're ever gonna break it, it goes all the way back to the thoughts. We gotta change our thinking to change our ways. And so we gotta deal with these deceitful desires, this futile thinking. And so that leads to verse 23. And this is the crux. If you're ever going to grow, you've got to be made new in the attitude of your mind. You've got to put off the old life. You've got to see it and hate it and say, I, I don't want to live that way anymore. But you've got to be made new in the attitude of your mind. You've got to think differently. It's all between the ears. That's where spiritual warfare takes place. This is the battleground. This is where everything really takes place. The outside is just clothing. It's just, it's, just, it's just how you live it out. But this is where it all takes place. And so if we're ever going to become something new, we got to be made new inside first. Be made new in the attitude of your mind. How does that happen? How are you and I ever going to become who we can be in Christ? Only by changing how we think and how we see things, changing our worldview, our beliefs, you got to be made new in the attitude of our minds. How does that happen? How do we reprogram ourselves in a sense? How do, how, do we, how do we change our perspective, our programming? And it's only by the word of God and the Holy Spirit working in us. And this is the key. If you're ever going to grow, you have to be in the word. And I mean in the word. I don't mean casually reading the word. I mean internalizing the word. 
so, so into the word, so, so processing the word that it becomes a part of your thinking. If it doesn't change your thinking, you haven't been in the word right. It's got to change how we think or we haven't read it right. So this is the idea. A lot of us, <laughs> if we ever start reading the Bible like we should, for me, it was just a chapter a day, just a chapter a day. But I found the temptation early on that there was this temptation to be able to say I read the word rather than really reading the word. It, it became this thing that I could, if I, if I wanted to, I could put a check box, check by the box or put a line through it and say I read the word, but I really didn't interact with the word when I read it. I wasn't really processing it and struggling to understand it and really incorporating it into my thinking. I was just jumping through a hoop so I could say I read the Bible so I could get my friend Roger off my back because he would hound me about, have you started reading your Bible yet? Have you started reading your Bible yet? And I started reading my Bible just so when he asked me that question, I could say yes. But the problem is that then he asked me, well, what'd you read? Then I had to know what I read. He wasn't going to let me off the hook. And so what happens is we can easily just skim through the Bible. In fact, we probably are reading too much of the Bible at times because we're really not internalizing it. We're really not taking it in. We're really not processing it and thinking about it, being really reprogrammed by it. And so when the Bible says, like, for instance, in James, this is how you read the Bible. It uses the word micros. It's the word we get microscope from, meaning it's really intently dialing in and focusing on what it says to understand what it says so we actually can do what it says. And so when we read the Bible, we're supposed to read it in such a way that we're actually thinking why we're doing it. And we're reading, I wonder what that is. What's an Ebenezer? Isn't that guy in Scrooge or something? Why is he in the Bible? What, what is that? And we should be constantly asking questions like that, saying, I don't understand this. What is he getting at? Remember those two verses I gave you? We should read through those verses and say, what? I don't understand this. What's he saying? And then we should maybe look up a word. Maybe say, you know, what is an Ebenezer? What, what, what is that? When it says, raise my Ebenezer, they lifted an Ebenezer. What? How do you lift an Ebenezer? He was a skinny guy, right? What, what, what is that? And, and, and you explore, you, you find good programs, new good websites, good Bible stuff, maybe good commentaries, Bible dictionaries, whatever. All that stuff's online now. And you look stuff up and you ask the question. You type in, what is an Ebenezer Bible? And I'll say, oh, it's a, it's a monument. It's, it's, it's a way of proclaiming the goodness of God. So you remember it's a monument, it's a memorial to what he's done in your life. And it's like, oh, that makes sense suddenly. I get it. And every time we read, we should be in it, trying to understand it and thinking, asking this question, okay, that's a cool story about David, but what does it have to do with me? What is God trying to tell me? And constantly giving the Holy Spirit the opening to show us something in our life that we need to know. We've got to expose ourselves to the word if we're ever going to be transformed because it's where the new programming comes from. It's where we hear, <laughs> do not bear false witness. And do not covet. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. It's, it's, it's this constant exposure that gives us this perspective of God. And so it's not just reading the Bible. It's listening to sermons, good podcasts, uh, and, and just being into the Word. So last time I gave you Romans 12 too, but I didn't give you the whole passage. Let's look at the whole passage and see, see what it's, because this is kind of a corollary to our passage. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, which is exactly what Paul's been telling us in Ephesians. <laughs> Get rid of that old way of living, right? Don't, don't live like the world. Don't be like the Gentiles, as he said last week. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's that being made new. Get rid of that old set of clothes, put on the new set of clothes, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, because it all begins with our thinking. Again, all we've heard so far, but notice what it says next, that you may prove what is that good, 
and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you'll be able to approve it. And that word prove is strong, right? It basically means you will live it out. You will prove the good will of God because you'll be living it. And people could see how better your life is. And you'll be able to demonstrate it because you'll just know the will of God. The more you're in the word of God, the more instinctively you will know the will of God. And it's just like, I know what God wants me to do. It's, 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 not, it's not really a hard question because I've been so reprogrammed in a sense that I'm now thinking his thoughts after him. So here's the big idea. Last week, it was to live differently, we have to think differently. And now we're just tagging a new phrase onto the end of it. If you're ever going to live differently, you've got to think differently. And to do that, and to think differently, we have to be in the Word. You just have to be in the world. So Paul puts it this way in Corinthians. Notice how he describes it. He says, the person with the Spirit, that's the Spirit, and we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we're hearing from the Spirit, and that Spirit now has Bible verses we've put on ourselves that he can use. We have this Bible knowledge that he can bring up. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. Isn't that cool? If you have the Spirit, you can make judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But notice this. This is the phrase I want you to see. But we have what? The mind of Christ. And that's the goal. To be so, so transformed by the Spirit and the Word of God, you, the, the Spirit using the Word of God in our life, that, that we've been made new in the attitudes of our mind. And because we've been made new in the attitudes of our mind, we actually look like new people. In fact, people will marvel. They'll say, they'll see you do something. It's like, what's happened to you? What's, what's, what's wrong with you? The old Mike would have never been that patient. What's going on? The, other, the old Mike would have chewed that guy out and, and let him have it. The old, guy, the old Mike would have had special colorful words for this situation, and you don't. What's going on? That's the clothing. That's the outfit. That's what they can see. That's what's on the outside, what the world can see. And it's happened because we now have the mind of Christ, and because we think like Christ, guess what? We begin to behave like Christ, and it's absolutely powerful. So be made in new in the attitude of your mind. So you ever want to know how to be, actually become that new creation? You got, it all begins in the mind. You've got to transform your thinking. So you've got to be in the word, always in the word. And then verse 24 brings it all home. And to, be, and to put on the new self, that's that new set of clothing, put on this new way of living that people can see and be amazed by, created to be like God. And this is the word I want you to see, true. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Why, why does he say true? What did, what did you have before this? What righteousness did you have before? It wasn't yours. It was Jesus's. It's not truly yours. It's, it's, it's borrowed in a sense. It's an Im imputed. Jesus takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. And then this process starts. We get the renewing of the mind going. And because we start thinking different, we start behaving different. And we actually start behaving like Jesus. And we are righteous. We're actually doing the things he would do. Not perfectly righteous, but we start having a righteousness of our own. It is a true righteousness in all these. Not a, not a borrowed, not, not an imparted one. It's one that comes from the inside out, from who we've become. And we're now made new in the attitudes of our mind. And so we're able to put on a new self. We're able to be transformed on the outside with this true righteousness, this, this good behavior. So this is the process. This is the process. This is the process you learned in Christ when it's saved. You learned that it comes through conviction. You get this revelation. You get this revelation about what you're doing wrong or, or, or how you're living, and, and you feel bad about it. You say, oh, I can't, I can't continue to do that. So you repent. You change your mind. You say, I, I can't go that way anymore. I got to go another way. I got to go God's way. And then what happens in your life? Because you start behaving differently. Righteousness again. So this is the pattern over and over and over. So let me give you this example from my, from my own life. So I got saved at 14. I, 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 was, I was an obnoxious, annoying teenage boy who caused problems, and I had an incredibly foul mouth. Incre I was raised in a house of mouth. I mean, it was, it, 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 we had one word on our list we were not allowed to say. 
We actually had a list in our house. Everything else was fair game. And so my, my dad could not do a project without cussing up a storm. He, it, just, it was just, that was our household. And still to this day, my brother and my sister, my, well, my dad passed away in the last few weeks, but it was just this foul mouth thing. And it's not just colorful words sprinkled in. It was crude and it was rude. And it was, it was, it was just filthy talk, if you can imagine that. Maybe none of you have been raised in a household like that. So dirty jokes, the whole, the whole works. Crude, just disgusting talk. And so I get saved at 14. My friend, that guy who's hounding me to read the Bible, I'm reading a chapter a day, and then it's okay, actually pay attention to it. So I'm actually thinking about what I'm reading. And so I'm reading through the whole New Testament in a year, just one chapter at a time. And it's beginning to do its work. Plus, on top of it, I'm at church, I'm listening to sermons. And in this particular story, I'm at a camp, and a guy's doing a devotion. And he goes to this passage, which comes up real quick. It's just a few verses away. It's under this heading of what we're talking about today. So it starts in verse 29, but notice what it says. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And that guy described what that word unwholesome means. And he gave very vivid details about what that meant. And unwholesome just means rotten, putrid. In fact, if you go to the gospels, it's used for rotting fish. Sound nice? Rotting fish. For, for me, what I thought of was potatoes. We love potatoes in our household. We, we go through bags of potatoes. We always have a bag of potatoes in the pantry because we go through so many potatoes. The problem with potatoes in the pantry, if you don't get to that end of that bag fast enough, you'll get one or two potatoes in there that get really soupy and wet and they start to rot. You ever have that experience? You know what I'm talking? And you go to get a bag, you go to get a, a potato out of that bag, and you undo that little tie thing, and you open the bag, and that smell just hits you, and it's that that dry retching, gaggy. I mean, it's really bad. I think it's worse than rotten fish. I mean, it's bad. That's this word. That's that's putrid, smelly, rotten talk. And so I'm hearing this guy talk, and he's saying, don't let anything rotten come out of your mouths. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? I, rotten stuff comes out of my mouth all the time. That's the Holy Spirit making me feel the weight of that, right? He's, he's convicting me. It, the colorful words, the vulgar talk, the, the, the dirty jokes. And, and, I, and then he, he, he noticed what he says, but only... What is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And so he's going through this passage and, and I'm like, why do I use these words? What's in me? What's wrong with me that I feel I need to use these words? You ever ask yourself why you do things? Because a lot of time, I don't know. No, but really, you know, Why? And God put me on the spot in that moment, and I thought about it. I think I'm trying to get attention. I'm trying to get acceptance. I'm trying to be cool. I'm trying to be light. And God revealed to me in that moment that it's really selfish, that I was really about myself. I was about lifting myself up, trying to get people's approval and to be light through foul language. And, and I was not building anybody else up. This is not language that builds anybody up. And then on top of it, I was grieving the Holy Spirit because I was a believer. And I was shutting his voice down. I was shutting his working in my life down. You just quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and so it was like salvation over again. I got a glimpse of myself and I didn't like what I saw. Conviction. Conviction. And that's, that's what's supposed to happen when we read the Bible. We should see stuff and say, oh, that's got to change in my life. And then what's the next step after conviction? Repentance. I'm ch you change your mind about that. And in that moment, I changed my mind about colorful words. They're, they're not good. They're, they're, they're not helping me with anybody. In fact, in fact, I'm only using them for selfish reasons. 
And in that moment, I repented. I turned on the dime. I did a 180 degree thing and I decided, okay, God, I see it. I'm not gonna live that way anymore. No more dirty jokes. No more colorful language. I gotta give this repentance. And then what's the third step? Righteousness. So what happened? I started living different. And so people are like, Mike, what, what happened? How come you don't use those colorful words anymore? Right, that kind of righteousness, I'm starting to be like Christ. I'm putting on true righteousness and holiness. And it was just a passage of scripture that I got exposed to the Holy Spirit used to do the same process over and over. And that's what happens. And that's what's supposed to be happening every day in our Bible reading, in, in our prayer time. Every, every time we go to church, we, we should be hearing things that challenge us and give us a glimpse of ourselves. And we realize, you know, I got I to gotta start doing how I do money different. I got to start managing my time different. I got to start getting up earlier, whatever. You, you, you get this process in many form over and over again, the conviction, right? The repentance and then the resulting righteousness, the change of life. And hopefully you can see hundreds of those cycles in your life. And let me tell you this, after 40 some years as a believer, I think 46 at this point, those processes never end. Our, our sin goes way deeper than we realize in our younger years. And there's always something to improve and there's something else to be transformed about. There's some new truth to embrace and use that the Holy Spirit uses in our life and we get transformed. Conviction, repentance, righteousness, over and over and over and over again. And so that old voice the BC voice is going to do everything to keep you from God. In fact, early on, as believers, how do you discern what is the bad voice and what is the good voice? The bad voice is the one that's trying to pull you from God. And that's the ultimate question. Is this taking me farther from God or closer to God? Is it taking me from the Bible? Is it taking me from prayer? Is it taking me from church? Is it taking me from small group? Is it taking me from something that will grow me? And then the Holy Spirit voice is the one taking you to God. It's the one that, you know, you probably should read your Bible. And the other voice says, no, 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 this is the dialogue, right? This is the argument. This is the two voices. No, I'm, I, I don't want to get up early like that. I don't want to get up at 6.30 in the morning when I can sleep till 7. Right? It's just this, this other voice, that stinking thinking voice, that voice that pulls us from God, that lesser angel, and then a Holy Spirit voice that says, no, you really should do it. And remember, you can grieve that Holy Spirit. You can quench him and you can just silence him if you get really off track. And you got to come back. So, if, here's the key, if God has shown you anything in your life, and it may have been a year ago, it may have been six months ago, it could have been last week, right? It could have been this morning. But if God has revealed anything to you and you went with that other voice, you basically stiff-armed God, stiff-armed the Holy Spirit, you grieved the Holy Spirit, and you decided, well, I'm going to do what I want versus what God wants. You're, you're, in, the, you're in that place where you, you are working on silencing the good voice and playing to the bad voice. You are feeding the evil wolf. And the, the one that you feed is the one that grows stronger. You're leaning in on the bad side. Don't go to that side of the force, right? That's the dark side of the force. You don't want to go that way. Don't feed that wolf. So if you've done that, you should be really cautious right now and say, you know, I've done that. What was it he was trying to tell me? Go back. Undo that decision you made where you distance yourself from what God wanted you to do and instead, go the way God wants you to do. Go back and correct it. Because again, after 46 years in the faith, there have been opportunities God has given me, and I've chosen the wrong path, and it's never paid out. It never works in your favor. In fact, God will keep coming back at it. And each time he comes back at it, it's worse. 
There's more baggage associated. There's more heartache. It hits you harder. There's more consequences. Trust me. The best thing you can do in life is when the Holy Spirit convicts you is get right on it. <laughs> First time. Save yourself lots of pain, lots of anguish, lots of heartache. Speed up the process too. This is, this is my biggest regret in Christianity is I wasn't more in the word. I wasn't more in prayer. I wasn't more diligent and intentional about this growth process. So I could be farther down the road in my race than I am. Throw off everything that hinders. That's what Paul says in that race. Throw off everything that hinders and run your race with everything you've got. And as I look back, there were times, there were these spans where I just wasn't listening to God and I wasn't given this full attention. And in those periods was when the greatest pain came and the greatest regrets and the consequences. And just as a guy who loves you, <laughs> I would love to save you from that. So when the Holy Spirit reveals you feel that conviction, turn on the dime, repent. Acknowledge, God, what you're saying is true, and I may not understand all of it yet because I got questions, but you're telling me, so I'm believing, and I'm putting this on instead. This is my new way of life, and I'm living in this righteousness. Do it right away. And as you honor God, it's a principle, right? As we honor God, he honors us, and he blesses us, and it is our best life. So don't believe the other voice that says your best life is somewhere else. Your best life is in obedience, is in righteousness, it's in holiness. Listen to the Holy Spirit and always move closer to God. Let's pray. Lord, Lord, as we gather this morning, we realize that, that you're doing this thing in us. You're doing this incredible work, this, this transformative work. You are, you are making us like Christ. You are making all things new. You are, you are actually doing the work of putting true righteousness and holiness into us rather than just what we've gotten from you. And we just praise you for that. Thank you that you don't just give up on us, that, that you, you bring to completion what you've started in us. And Lord, help us to just be willing accomplices in that. Help us to be, be totally in on that. Help us to want what you want for us and help us to give ourselves to the process that you have for us. So help us to put off these old lifestyles that you reveal to us and, and help us to be made new in the attitude of the mind. Put on new thinking through your word. Help us to see things more and more clearly according to your worldview and your truth. And Lord, help us then to also put on this new way of life, this, this new set of clothes that we get to wear where people are like, wow, what happened? What happened to those filthy rags? <laughs> Help us to have true righteousness and holiness. And Lord, for all of us who have messed up in this way, we've all stumbled in many ways. That's what your word tells us. Where we've ignored the good voice and fed the bad wolf, Lord. Uh, Lord, we just ask you would help us to come home. You would forgive us. Forgive us for our stubbornness and our willfulness, our rebellion. And you'd help us to turn the corner and come back. Come back to that moment. And start living the way you told us to live just because you told us to live it. And help us to live in righteousness. True righteousness. And Lord, if something was mentioned today that just hit somebody, Lord, help them to stand up and in a sense really listen, be really in, in tune with you and help them to do whatever it is that you've shown them. And Lord, if there's somebody here that's not saved, but they're feeling that weight of conviction, they're, they're getting a glimpse of themselves, we praise you for that. That is an opportunity, Lord. That is, that is the gift from you that some people just never receive. And Lord, help them to respond to that conviction with repentance and with <laughs> this turning to you and Jesus and receiving your righteousness so that they might be forgiven and have life. Help them in that. Help them to believe in you and save them. And Lord, we just praise you for being faithful. 
and for not leaving us as orphans, for giving us a process we can, we can use, intentionally use every day to grow, to be like you and help us to live in it. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.